tonight. Voting on the way. India continues to see thousands file into the polling booths to decide on the nation's future. Modi facing some backlash following remarks on the country's Muslim population. Delicate diplomacy. Iran's President Raisi arrives in Pakistan for talks with PM Shabazz in a potential soothing of tensions in the region. Continuing conflict. Israel remains unrelenting in its efforts against Hamas as more strikes cause chaos in the region. And pause in the air. The first class treatment, several thousand feet in the air, now open for man's best friend. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening, welcome to World News Tonight. Hope everyone watching has had a pleasant weekend and is ready to get the latest updates from across the globe. Without any further ado, let us get right to our top story tonight, which is updates on India's elections. After 10 years of Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party rule in northern Uttar Pradesh, people in Muzaffaranagar, one of the most populous Muslim cities in the region, will be waiting to see if they will get a new leader as they went to vote in the first phase of elections. This comes as Prime Minister Narendra Modi has been accused of delivering Islamophobic remarks during an election rally. Hindu nationalism is a key election theme, especially after Modi's consecration of a grand temple to Lord Ram in January on a site in Uttar Pradesh. Critics accuse Modi's government and party of treating India's 200 million minority Muslims unfairly to please their hardline Hindu base, an accusation that both deny. Over in northwestern Bikana, voters battled heat wave as they queued in large numbers at remote polling stations to cast their votes. Modi aims to win 370 seats of the parliament's 543 seats, up from 303 in 2019, hoping for a two-thirds majority that some analysts and opposition members fear could let his party usher in far-reaching constitutional changes. And on more election updates, Maldives is well on its way in adopting its India Out policy. Maldives President Mohamed Muizu's party has won a landslide victory in a parliamentary election, cementing his grip on power. Results show the People's National Congress won 66 seats in the 93-member House. Analysts view the victory as strong backing for Mr Muizu's policy to achieve close ties with China. Mr Muizu, who is widely seen as a pro-China, wants to reduce India's long-standing influence in his country. Local media have described the PNC's win, which will be ratified in several days' time, as a supermajority. It has achieved the two-thirds majority in the parliament that is required to amend the constitution. The main opposition Moldavian Democratic Party has managed to win only 15 seats. Prior to Sunday's vote, it had the majority of the seats in the parliament. Mr. Musu came to power late last year and his campaign was centred on ending the country's India First policy that was adopted by the previous government. He has yet to embark on an official visit to Delhi. And still in the region, we see some delicate diplomacy moves at play. Iran's President Ibrahim Raisi arrived in Islamabad for a three-day official visit as the two Muslim neighbors seek to mend ties after unprecedented tit-for-tat military strikes this year. He was received by Federal Minister for Housing and Works, Mian Riaz Hussain Prizada. Raisi will meet Prime Minister Sheba Sharif and the other officials besides visiting the eastern city of Lahu and the southern port city of Karachi. Major highways in Islamabad were blocked as a part of the security measures for Raisi's arrival, while the government declared a public holiday in Karachi. Raisi's visit is a key step towards normalizing ties with Islamabad, but Iran's supreme leader, not the president, has the last say on the state matters, such as the nuclear policy. Tension is also high in the Middle East after Iran launched an unprecedented attack on Israel a week ago and central Iran in turn suffered what sources say was an Israel attack on Friday. Now, the United States has imposed sanctions against four entities, including three Chinese companies and one Belarus-based firm, for their involvement in supplying missile-related items to Pakistan's ballistic missile program. According to the statement, these entities have provided missile-applicable items to Pakistan's ballistic missile program, including its long-range missile program. And for more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Shanika Dharmaratna from Vietbesk in Belarus. Shanika, what's the latest? Yes, Anuradhi, China 
and all-weather ally of Pakistan has been the main supplier of arms and defense equipment to Islamabad's ambitious military modernization program. The Minsk wheel tractor plant from Belarus has also been implicated. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller said, these entities have engaged in activities or transactions that have materially contributed to or pose a risk of materially contributing to Pakistan military development. The main square tractor plant in Belarus supplied special vehicle chassis to Pakistan's long-range ballistic missile program. China's Xi'an Long Day Technology Development Company Limited supplied missile related equipment, including a filament winding machine, to Pakistan's long range ballistic missile program that the US said was destined for Pakistan's NDC. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Shanuka Dharmaratna from Vietbesk in Belarus. We're going in for a short commercial break now. We'll be right back with more key global updates. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We have updates now on the Israel-Hamas conflict. The Palestinian Health Ministry said all three of the Palestinians who attacked Israeli forces in two incidents in the occupied West Bank died when Israeli forces opened fire on them. This comes as more mass grave sites continue to be uncovered in the region, with Netanyahu vowing continued pressure following the dismissal of his military intelligence chief. A cameraman saw a body at the scene of the incident, a junction near the Palestinian city of Hebron. The official Palestinian news agency, WAFA, quoting local sources, said that Israeli forces shot the two men and ambulance crews were prevented from reaching them. Palestinian security forces told WAFA that the two men, aged 18 and 19, died and that they were still unable to collect their bodies. Violence in the West Bank, already on the rise before the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza, has escalated with frequent army raids on militant groups, rampages by Jewish settlers in Palestinian villages and Palestinian street attacks. On Sunday, mourners fire in the air at a funeral for Palestinians killed by Israeli forces in a raid the day before. Palestinian health authorities said at least 14 Palestinians were killed in the Nur Shams area near the flashpoint city of Tulkam. The Israeli army released a video said to show its operations, which began in the early hours of Friday, not able to independently confirm the date or location of the footage. Separately on Saturday, an ambulance driver was killed as he went to pick up wounded from a separate attack by violent Jewish settlers, Palestinian authorities said. Israel's military did not immediately comment on the ambulance driver's death on Saturday. The war in Gaza has overshadowed continuing violence in the West Bank. Thousands of Palestinians have been arrested and hundreds killed during regular operations in the West Bank by Israeli army and police since the start of the Gaza war on October 7th. Those killed were mostly members of armed groups, but also stone-throwing youths and uninvolved civilians. And still on the conflict, global deal talks continue to find a way out of the crisis. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak made a phone call to Jordan's King Abdullah to discuss developments in the Gaza Strip. During the call, Sunak renewed the UK's support for Jordan's security and that of the region, saying a significant escalation is not in anyone's interest. And for more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Pawani Mudalge from Essex in the UK. Pawani. Yes, Anuradi, he added that the UK's focus remains on finding a solution to the conflict in Gaza. Sunak said the UK continues to work toward an immediate humanitarian interest to bring in much larger amounts of aid and return the Israeli hostages held by Hamas safely to their families, leading to a longer-term sustainable ceasefire. Downing Street said the two leaders discussed joint efforts to significantly step up aid to Gaza, with the UK taking part in Jordanian late airdrops and an humanitarian land corridor to Gaza, as well as the maritime aid corridor from Cyprus. Sunak told the King that the UK's ultimate goal is to achieve a workable, 
two-state solution for Israelis and Palestinians. Back to you, Anne Rabi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the world news special correspondent Pawani Mudalige from Essex in the UK. Some weather woes plague China tonight. Rescuers on boats in China's flood hit Guangdong province raced to evacuate trapped residents, carrying some elderly people by piggyback from their homes and deploying helicopters to save villagers caught in landslides. Ling Zui Zhen lives in Qingyan City. Since two years ago, the rainfall started to get relatively heavy, and this year. In the past, the floods rarely rose to this point. At least the floods got drained. Situated in the densely populated Pearl River Delta, the province once coined the factory floor of the world, Guangdong is prone to summer floods and has previously put in place strong defences to limit the effect. But since Thursday, the region has been battered by record-breaking rainfall, bringing the wet season earlier than expected. That's raising concern that flood defences are becoming inadequate as global warming makes weather events more unpredictable and more extreme. No fatalities have yet been reported, but a number of people are missing. On Sunday, domestic flights arriving in Guangzhou were briefly cancelled and international ones delayed. Some foreign carriers flying to other Chinese destinations took big detours to avoid the area. Just in Guangxi, a region west of Guangdong, Nearly 100,000 people have been affected by the rain, with direct economic losses totaling nearly 285 million yuan, or almost $40 million. And on the road to the White House tonight, the latest polls find the third-party vote and especially independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. cutting deeper into former President Donald Trump's support than President Joe Biden's. Though the movement of the other candidates create is within the poll's margin of error. Take a look. Trump leads Biden by two percentage points in a head-to-head -head matchup. 46% to 44% in the new poll. Yet when the ballot is expanded to five named candidates, Biden is the one with the two-point advantage. Biden at 39%, Trump 37%, Kennedy at 13%, Jill Stein 3% and Cornell West 2%. The big reason is that the poll finds a greater share of Trump voters in the head-to-head -head matchup backing Kennedy in the expanded ballot. 15% of respondents who picked Trump the first time picked Kennedy in five-way ballot compared with 7% of those who initially picked Biden. In addition, Republican voters viewed Kennedy much more favorably than Democratic voters do. Going in for a short commercial break now, more world news right after this. Welcome back. When traversing through the skies, there is no one that would not prefer the first class treatment. And a group of dog loving entrepreneurs certainly believe that our possum buddies are also deserving of a glimpse into lying in the lap of luxury at cruising altitudes. Take a look. Sure, some airlines welcome dogs on board. And today I'm going to fly like a dog in a crate. How do you feel about a four hour flight? Uh, I don't feel good about the next four minutes in this. There has to be a better way. But on Bark Air, dogs are royalty. The future of travel is here. World-class dining. Critically acclaimed in-flight entertainment. Introducing Bark Air. And yes, this is for real. Bark Air has thought of everything to make the dog flying experience exceptional. Once on board the flights of 15 to 16 passengers, dogs live the good life. Bark Air's inaugural flight takes off next month. It's not cheap, but they're working on lower prices and working on ways to make it the perfect experience for dog lovers and their furry friends. Seems like a worthy first class experience for both pup and parent. Well, that wraps up our bulletin tonight here at World News. Join us again tomorrow for more key global updates. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.